let's all stand to our feet. And uh, let's hold our Bibles up. We, we invite the internet congregation to do this with us as well. And let's say this together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible. I believe the Bible. It's your word. It's the truth. It's a love letter from you to me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated and you can uh, be turning with me to Luke chapter 15. And we're going to start there with our uh, scripture for this message. And the theme for this message is, uh, well, the title is The Key to Encouragement. And the theme is we're going to see from the scriptures that we're going to go over is that the key to staying encouraged and energized by the joy of the Lord is this. Base your success on finding and helping that one person in need. You know, we can all do that if we'll uh, think of that one person uh, in need. And this goes along with our vision. Our vision for the church is to find purpose in life through loving God and loving people. And they are hurting people that need love everywhere we turn. But we need to base our success on finding that one person that God leads us to. And uh, just to give you an example from uh, history, you, you may have heard this before. I know Brandon shared in a message recently, but it's so powerful and true. A Sunday school teacher, a Mr. Kimball, in 1858, led a Boston shoe clerk to give his life to Christ. The clerk, Dwight L. Moody, became an evangelist. In England in 1879, he awakened evangelistic zeal in the heart of Fred Frederick B. Meyer, pastor of a small church. F.B. Meyer, preaching to an American college campus, brought to Christ a student named J. Wilbur Chapman. Chapman engaged in YMCA work, employed a former baseball player, Billy Sunday, to do evangelistic work. Billy Sunday held a revival in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a group of local men were so enthusiastic that they planned another evangelistic campaign, bringing Mordecai Ham to town to preach. During Ham's revival, a young man named Billy Graham heard the gospel and yielded his life to Christ. Only eternity will reveal the tremendous impact of that one Sunday school teacher, Mr. Kimball, who in invested his life in the lives of others. You know, there's no telling what can happen when you just focus in on that one person that God leads you to and base your encouragement and joy on making an impact in that person's life. Amen. Well, let's read some scripture on this in Luke chapter 15, beginning in uh, verse, well, we'll start in verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, to Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he said, aren't you glad of that? <laughs> because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So he spoke this parable to them saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. <clears throat> and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and righteous neighbors to them, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. I'm telling you that one sinner that repents brings joy in heaven and it should bring joy to us. Amen. Again, the key to staying encouraged and energized by the joy of the Lord is to base your success on finding and helping that one person in need. Lloyd John Ogilvy said, there's, quote, there's nothing more exciting than helping another person become a Christian except helping that person into an exhilarating experience of discipleship. So uh, we can impact them further and stay a part of their lives. Amen. As long as they'll permit us to over that one sinner who repents. 
I remember years ago, this is decades ago, uh, Shaw and I were traveling, and actually I think I'd only been saved maybe a couple of years, and we were ministering a lot at full gospel businessmen, uh, banquet meetings and state retreats and so forth. I, we've spoken at hundreds of full gospel businessmen uh, banquet dinners, and they were more active, I believe, in those days than they are now. And I was speaking at the downtown been invited down there to give my testimony uh, downtown at the Full Gospel Businessmen luncheon meeting. And uh, I remember this woman coming forward where she heard my testimony and how I'd been delivered from uh, drugs and alcohol. And she was severely addicted to cocaine. And she came up in the prayer line. Shaw was there with me. And we were praying for her and uh, just believing God with her for her deliverance. And this was the most amazing thing. I've never seen this happen before. We, we were praying for her and was looking down and all of a sudden all I could see were her shoes. Her shoes were still there, but somehow the power of God had thrown her out of her shoes <laughs> back several feet onto her back. I mean, it was, I looked and I saw her laying out there and we realized what had happened. And we encouraged her, you know, and the others there encouraged her, but she was totally set free from that addiction, we didn't think too much about it. But years later, after we had, uh, quite a few years later, after we had founded this church and we were meeting over in the Greens Point area, a man came up to me after service. He said, I just wanted to share with you, I was uh, downtown the inner city church and there's a woman who's pastor in that church and uh, she gave a testimony that she got saved and set free at a full gospel businessmen meeting in downtown and you and Char laid hands on her and she was totally delivered from cocaine addiction and she's founded this church in the inner city and she's pastor in that church and people are getting saved there and also you never know sometimes you don't see uh, people again but but just thank God every time someone comes to Christ there is no limit to what God can do with their lives and how many they can impact so we ought to all always realize how important it is to reach out to that, that individual person. I shared, I think it might have been Wednesday night, but it, it bears repeating. We were in Tampico, Mexico some years ago ministering in a jail, and there in the drunk tank, they throw the men and women in together. They don't separate them. And when you go in, the door slams behind you, and no guard goes in with you. You're just there by yourselves. Roland, I believe you were on this trip with us. And you remember the little, there was a, a little guy there uh, in the drunk tank and he had dried glue all over his face. This dried white glue all over his face. We didn't know what it was at first and someone said, well, it's dried glue. He had been sniffing glue and passed out in the glue. It's a wonder he didn't choke to death. And there he was and uh, we were ministering and Anita Vasquez was translating and I remember uh, he was a, a, a small man of small stature, and he, would, he looked like he didn't know where he was. And we're preaching the gospel, and he, he would kind of walk up to me and Anita, and Anita was translating into Spanish and just kind of stare at us like that. And I thought, surely this man doesn't even hear what's going on. We had a prayer of salvation, and I noticed he was kind of mumbling along with us, and I thought, there's no way he can know, even know what he's saying. He's so out of it. Do you know that man, the, the pastor of the church who led us in there, it was an Assembly of God church there in Tampico. He said that that man actually got saved and delivered that night and that he became uh, one of his best members of his church. And uh, he actually sent him out. He became a leader in the church and he sent him and a group out to found another church. And he became uh, one used in pioneering a new church there. So you never know what God is going to do to that one person and how he's going to use them to impact others. We ought to always be excited whenever God leads us to share the Lord Jesus Christ with anyone else. So the one sinner who repents is the person we should be looking for. Also, in John chapter 4, the, you know the story of the woman at the well. And the Bible says in John chapter 4 that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Well, he needed to go through Samaria because he wanted to minister to that, that one 
abused and broken person, that woman at the well. And you know, Jesus sat with her and told her about her life, things that she had not shared. But she, he shared with her how he knew she'd been married several times, I believe it was five times, and that she was living with a man out of wedlock. And he could, you know, he could tell this woman was, had been abused, she had been broken, her heart was broken, and he needed to go through Samaria. Why? To minister to that one broken woman there at, at, by Jacob's well. And do you know what happened? Through her, she went out and told the whole city about this man who told her she could have living water. She didn't have to pull that water from that well. He'd give her living water that would spring up like a well from within her. And she went out and told the whole city about it and the city turned out and because of this one broken, abused woman that Jesus reached out to, he reached the whole city Amen. with his good news. Amen, that he had come to save the world. Hallelujah, that, that the Messiah had come. So, it, you know, we need to look for that abused and that broken person and uh, stay encouraged and energized by knowing that we can impact that person's life. Amen. Well, in Mark chapter 5, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. And I won't read all of these scriptures, but Jesus, he, he crossed the sea uh, to go to the uh, country of the Gadarenes. And you know, what he did over there, he delivered a, demo a demoniac, a man that was possessed of a demon. It's obvious that he crossed that sea just to minister to that one man who was demon-possessed. This man was severely demon-possessed. They would uh, bind him with chains to try to restrain him. He would even break the chains. And he would, uh, it, he would cut himself. He'd stay in the mountains and among the tombs. Stayed there in the cemetery, cutting himself and crying out. You know, this man was, he was severely demon-possessed and he was hurting Jesus crossed that sea of Galilee to minister to this one man. And he says when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped Jesus. He still had enough control to be able to run, throw himself at the feet of Jesus. Amen. And Jesus, as, as we read further in verse 9, he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And uh, we see how he ministered to him and uh, some of the things that happened there. And the, these people in the city were all upset because the demons went out from this man and went into a herd of swine that went over a cliff and committed suicide. I wrote that in the margin of my Bible, suicide. Anyway, those, those swine went out and committed suicide. And that got the people in the village so upset they wanted Jesus to leave. They weren't excited about the demoniac being delivered. They were upset because their swine had committed suicide. But he was sitting there in his right mind delivered through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And in verse 16, uh, in verse uh, 17, they began to plead with Jesus to leave. And so really the only person that received ministry was that one demon-possessed man. And it says in, in uh, verse 18, when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed, the, the, previous, the man that was previously demon-possessed, now set free, he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marvel. So this man became an evangelist and Decapolis was an area of 10 cities and he went out and evangelized those 10 cities that one demon-possessed man that had been delivered. And I, wanted, I, I did some study on this and this is not in the Bible, but it is recorded in church history. It has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD that Jesus, you know, had said would happen. Also, the Jewish believers there who had accepted Jesus were warned that the Romans were coming to destroy the city. 
according to what has been written in history, and they were warned through a prophecy that that was coming, and the uh, Jewish believers who had accepted Jesus as their Messiah, it's reported that every one of them left Jerusalem, and the area they went to was Decapolis. And so this one demon-possessed man who, who went back to where he was from and evangelized that whole area, he was preparing that area to receive thousands of Jewish believers into their protection when the Romans invaded Jerusalem in 70 AD. Can you imagine what happened just because that one demon-possessed man was delivered? Look at how people, how many thousands of people were blessed and protected. Can you shout hallelujah? Amen. Amen. So God's always, the, the, the plans when we're, when we're looking for that one person to help, God has plans that go beyond that one person. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I remember, you know, talking about the demon possessed. We were in a village with Helen Mann. You know, Roland, I think maybe you were on this trip too. A lot happened on that. I think it was the same trip, but we went into a village, and Miguel may have been on that trip. He went on. But we went into a village, and the, the pastor of the church had a sister who was a witch. She was a practicing witch. She was demon-possessed. And she had many of the people in that village uh, there. Uh, it was uh, in the area, kind of general vicinity of Tampico, but out quite a few miles from there in a village. No, near Victoria, excuse me, near Victoria, but in a village there. And you had the interesting situation, the pastor's sister being the main opponent of the church. And she actually had more people following her and the church was having a hard time getting people to come because the pastor's sister was working against the church and she was doing her witchcraft and all that kind of stuff and invoking curses and everything. Well, Helen, man, she was a short little woman. She was only about four feet ten. But she was full of the Holy Spirit. And uh, she was from Georgia, had a very pronounced southern accent. And he wanted, he, she found out about the situation. She had actually raised the money that had, um, for the, to build the church that was there. And um, had done the uh, evangelism there and so forth, taking groups down that had. And uh, she wanted to meet with this sister of the pastor who was the main opposition in the village. And she came in, and I'm telling you, I saw that little, short little woman command that demon of witchcraft to come out of that woman, and that woman collapsed in a heap uh, in the floor. And you had this little, short woman from Georgia, Helen Mann, she was standing over this woman that was being delivered, and she said, you come out of her in the name of Jesus. You come out of her in Jesus' name. <laughs> you devil, you. And I mean, she's a little short woman, you know, so, yeah, in, you devil, you. Uh, I'm telling you, that woman got up totally delivered from that spirit of witchcraft. And she started working with her brother, and that church became, began to thrive, and they reached the whole village with the gospel of Jesus Christ after that. And you know, that, we were there. It wasn't a time for a church service. That was the only thing we did when we went into that village that day. It was important to the Lord for that one woman to get delivered. And that was a breakthrough for the whole village. What, what we're talking about is the key to staying encouraged and energized by the joy of the Lord is this. Base your success on finding that and helping that one person in need. Because you know, that woman, she was damaging that village, but she was hurting herself because of the deception that taken hold of her life. Then I think in, over in John chapter 5, if you'll turn with me there, you see this Jesus operating like this. So we follow his ministry. He went to, uh, in, verse, in John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and it says, and after this, there was a feast of Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, 
There was a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. You can see those when you go to Jerusalem. That, that's still there today. Chris knows he's seen it. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Let me just pause right there. You know, I believe this was a measure of grace that God was extending through this angel uh, for healing as a sign to the people that he heals. But when you stop and think about it, it was the person that stepped in first that got healed. So that was probably the most ablest one there. He was able to get in ahead of all the rest of them. So he was certainly, the person able to get in first was certainly not the sickest person there when you stop and think about it. Okay, with that in mind, beginning in verse 5 of John chapter 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. You know, he's saying, not only are these other people able to get in ahead of me, I don't even have anybody to help me get in the water. <laughs> and and when the water is stirred, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And I mean, uh, he stirred everything up. You know, <laughs> I'm telling you, they knew Jesus had been there. But it's interesting that Jesus came there and he picked out who the person who was probably the sickest person there and singled him out and walked up to him and asked him if he wanted to be made well. And of course, that's something we, have to, we need to know. We have to have that want to. If we, if, we want to. if we want to see that miracle operating in our life, we want to believe God for that healing, whether it comes instantly or through recovery. If we want to see God touch us with healing, we need to have that want to. And that man... In his way, he was saying, yes, I want to. I just can't. He was trying to process all that, you know. And he, I just can't get in the water fast enough. And, well, he found out that Jesus was bringing living water to him. The waters of healing were coming to him. And he healed him. And that impacted the, uh, the religious community there and everyone there. They all heard about this and it had a major impact. And so here again, you see uh, Jesus reaching out to that Yes, he healed the multitudes, but also he was always concerned about that one person that was hurting and that was in, in need. I think of Carl Lutness, senior. Uh, he's well into his 80s now. He was at a Catherine Kuhlman meeting in Dallas, Texas. He had gotten invited there by someone, and uh, he had uh, retired from the military. He was a, a major or colonel in the... Uh, Army, I believe, Army or Air Force. But anyway, he had severe back problems and he was scheduled, this was on a weekend, and he was scheduled that Monday for back surgery. And somebody told him about this woman, Catherine Kuhlman, who would pray for people in the name of Jesus. If any of you remember, she used to, Johnny Carson would have her on her show. She was kind of a strange little woman. I mean, she, she was not a normal looking person. She was uh, full of the Holy Spirit. And she was a, a, a really anointed with the gift of healing and miracle working. And uh, Carl Lutness went to that meeting being urged by others to go. And he said he was sitting there, you know, trying to just be there incognito, <laughs> sitting in the audience. He said this strange little woman walked up to him and pointed her finger at him and uh, touched him and pronounced healing over him. And he said he felt different. He knew something had happened. He checked in the hospital the next day and they did the test uh, before, that they do before you know, the surgery and they said, we don't understand this, but something's happened. You don't need the surgery. Your back's fine. They canceled the surgery. Through that, Carl accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And think of all the people that may have been in that meeting. I know what happened with Carl Lutnitz because of that touch that showed him how real God was 
And of course, she always ministered in the name of Jesus and gave Jesus all the glory. If you ever saw any of the films of her meetings. And uh, worship was a big part of her services. Carl immediately uh, became a missionary and he uh, moved to Saltillo, Mexico, set up a base there. And I believe he did more than any person I know to introduce Mexico to the power of the Holy Spirit. Worked with hundreds and hundreds of churches, uh, doing evangelistic meetings, providing uh, materials for churches, equipment for churches, uh, working with Christ for the Nations to put roofs on churches. And uh, I believe that Eternal Love Ministries has made more of an impact uh, in Mexico than any ministry I know of as far as helping churches and other evangelistic ministries to reach out to people and especially introducing the power of the Holy Spirit to Mexico. Uh, all because Jesus reached out to him at that meeting that day. And so thousands upon thousands of people have been reached. Not only that, he, he went to China and had an impact in China as well. And you've heard him share about that. And the work continues on. And the work continues in Mexico through uh, his son. And, and it's, it's continuing to expand and to grow. Then in uh, Mark chapter 1. Turn with me there. Mark chapter 1. Verse 40 to 45. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed, and he strictly warned him, and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer uh, for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely. He just couldn't help it. <laughs> and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. Why? Because he reached out to that one untouchable person. I, I remember one, uh, one trip to India. Shore and I were ministering uh, in a an impoverished area of uh, Bombay. Most of that area uh, is impoverished. And they brought to us some people to that meeting that were considered untouchables. And they were very humble, meek people. And they brought them up in a prayer line. We were just praying over needs of, of people, you know, like we have here. And they were bringing the people up. And they, this one man had about, I don't know, five or six people. And these people were classified... Uh, through the Hindu religion, the caste system there is being untouchable. And when we laid hands on them to pray for them, they began to weep and to cry. And they'd come up for healing. They, they were sick. And the, the person interpreting and translating for us, asking why they were crying, they said, well, they're, their hearts are so touched, they've never had a, anyone outside their caste. They're not used to people touching them, and it's touched their hearts that you would touch them. And that just broke our hearts. I mean, we started crying that these people would be treated. That people couldn't even touch them. And God healed every one of them instantly. It was wonderful to see it. But not only that, more important than that, they surrendered their souls to Jesus Christ. And God delivered them from that caste system. Not that they didn't experience persecution after that, but they, they were saved. They were set free in their hearts. And you know, Jesus, he doesn't recognize uh, racism and caste system and stuff like that. He came for every human being. <laughs> we're all part of the human race. And these things that man has invented to oppress and put people down, Jesus doesn't recognize. He reaches through all that. He reaches out to every man, woman on the earth today. And as believers, we should be willing to let him use us wherever he wants to. Interestingly, since that time, this was quite a few years, decades ago when this happened, but since that time, the greatest move of God in India has happened among the untouchables. Not, oh, I guess it was about almost 10 years ago, uh, they totally rejected Hinduism. 
their leaders did because they said, you know, we've come to the realization that you tell us we're not even touchable. What has the Hindu religion done for us? Nothing. You won't even touch us. And uh, their leaders officially adopted Buddhism, but they are more free-spirited people, and uh, many, many of them, hundreds of millions of them have turned to Christ Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior there in India. These numbers are not yet in the official figures of the believers uh, in India because the persecutions there really, they vary from state to state, but most of the states require that when they submit to water baptism that they register with the government. And that is the way they count Christians, but that's also the way they identify them and things happen like their electricity getting cut off, them getting uh, mistreated and so forth because they've left the predominant religion of the land is the way they look upon it. But the uh, untouchables, which are mostly among, more among the tribal peoples, uh, they are more free-spirited. They go ahead and get water baptized, but they don't register with the state. So there's m many... Uh, this, actually, the numbers are estimated to be hundreds of millions of them have turned to Jesus there in India for salvation and accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. We need to... Listen, we need to always be there for every single person on earth and never let any kind of man-made barriers prevent us from reaching out to lost and hurting people. Amen. And then, last, I just want to share from Acts chapter 16. And we're talking about this last category. We need to be looking for that one man who has a heart for his people. And in Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6, it says, now when they had gone through Pergia, the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. You have to follow the Holy Spirit in his timing. Verse 7, after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. Verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. But notice that it was a man that appeared in the vision to Paul, come to Macedonia and help us. And I'm convinced that on this entire trip, Paul was looking for that man he saw in the vision. He ministered to several people along the way, but he was looking for the man. And uh, that, cause that's the way Paul was. He always wanted to serve God and be obedient to him. Well, he, he, first thing that happens, he, he runs into a women's a group that are down by the river and uh, having prayer, and he le leads all them to the Lord. You know, <laughs> thank God for women. You know, women are, we noticed in ministry in Mexico, usually the women and children are the first one to come in and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the men, they start coming in. Anyway, he, he runs into this, this group of women praying, leads them to the Lord, then he gets irritated somewhat by this woman possessed with a spirit of divination uh, who was a, a, a slave girl. And uh, so he finally, he, he commands that demon to come out of her. And of course, the, her owners get all upset because they were making money off of her with, through uh, this spirit of divination, her doing the fortune telling, all that kind of junk, you know. And so, uh, but he cast that uh, spirit out of her and got her delivered. It's in, in that one person, but he's thrown in jail. And you would think, well, you know, if you were in Paul's position, you think, you know, I saw that man in that vision and I'm over here and uh, thank God for women and thank God for women praying and thank God for that woman possessed with the spirit of divination getting delivered. But there he and Silas are in chains and he's probably wondering, what am I doing in jail? Where's that man God showed me in the vision? And so you know what they start doing? Instead of complaining and getting upset, they just start worshiping and praising God at midnight and an earthquake hits that place and their chains fall off of them. And uh, Paul looks and he sees the jailer because the, the jailer was responsible. And he would be executed if any of them escaped. That was the punishment for the jailer. And so he was about to do himself in. And Paul saw that jailer. And he said, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. 
And I believe that Paul, when he saw that jailer, he saw the man that God had showed him in the vision. He is looking for that one man. That whole trip, he ministered to several people and had impact all along the way. Uh, with the women, the prayer meeting, the, the, the girl possessed with the spirit of divination. But he had his heart set on that one man that God had showed him in the vision. And he saw him. And he said, do yourself no harm. We're all here. And so the, the jailer invited him back to his home and they, you know, ministered to their wounds and so forth. And he, the whole family accepted Jesus and were saved. And this is not in the scripture, but if you'll read in, in church history, it's recorded reliably in church history that this man became the nucleus of the church there in Macedonia and he became the chief leader of the church in that area. And God established that very important uh, church because Paul was looking for that one man. And that's where he found his joy and his encouragement was in knowing that he had obeyed God. We need to always realize the value of every single person that God puts us in contact with. Amen. So I just encourage you... Uh, you know, sometimes we can get our mind set on, well, I'm not doing anything. The next person you reach out to could reach this whole nation or even the world or other nations. So just get your joy, your encouragement out of obeying God and reaching out to that one. Amen. It may be the, the man who has a heart for his people like the jailer in Macedonia. It, it may be like the untouchable in um, Mark chapter 1. It may be like that one sick person that you hear about that God sends you to, to reach out to. Let me tell you, uh, God has called all believers to lay hands on the sick. That's not the sign of pastors. It's not the sign of apostles and, and uh, teachers and evangelists. It, in the Bible it says these signs that Jesus said in the last chapter of Mark, these signs will follow those who believe. And he said, in my name, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He's called all believers to lay hands on the sick. Amen. I'm telling you, if you lay hands on enough sick people, you're going to see miracles. You're going to see people's lives change. That one sick person, that, that demon-possessed person, don't give up on them just because they're demon-possessed. You might see some of the most powerful results by reaching out to that demon-possessed person. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Through that abused and broken person, like that woman at the well, been married five times, living with a man out of wedlock, no doubt very much abused and brokenhearted, Jesus reached out to her and through her reached that whole area, that whole city. And then, uh, of course, Luke chapter 15, where we started, that one center, sinner, that one sinner who repents. Amen. Praise God. I just want to encourage you with that. And let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we just thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can all find purpose in life through loving you and loving people and through looking for that one person that you send us to today or tomorrow. Looking for that one each day in Jesus name Lord help us to follow your direction and see the potential that every person on this earth has to serve you the potential that each one has in your kingdom and as we say this we're reminded of your word which Lord we believe Jeremiah spoke to us all when he said for I know the thoughts that I think toward you says the Lord thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And Lord, we, uh, uh, I'd like to ask everyone here in, in an attitude of prayer and with a reverence for God with your head still bowed, please, those watching by internet as well, eyes closed in an uh, attitude of prayer and, and with a reverence for God. I'd like to ask everyone here just to look into your hearts, all those, all those within the hearing of my voice, to look in your hearts and ask yourself this question. Do I know that I know that I know that I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior? 
You know, Jesus has done the hard part. The Bible says that he suffered for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus took the wages for our sins by dying on that cross. And all he asks of us is that decision to turn to him. That's repentance, where we turn away from the way of the world and turn to Jesus with our whole hearts. Repentance literally means to turn. And so all he asks of us is to repent, make that decision of repentance, to accept Jesus as one's personal Lord and Savior. The only way to come to God is through the merits of Jesus. We can't get there on our own merits. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's only through the merits of that sinless Savior, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross to take the punishment and judgment for our sins so that through Him we can have forgiveness, eternal life, and a new beginning with our lives. If that's what you want, you're saying, you know, that's what I need. I need to make that decision to accept Jesus. It's all about choice. God's not limited by any man's or any woman's weaknesses. He's only limited by our decisions. If you want to make that most important decision of all, to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want you to lift your hand up high right where you are. Whether you're in this church or whether you're watching by internet, God sees your hand wherever you are. Just lift it up high. I want to receive Jesus. I want to make that important decision to accept Him as my personal Lord and Savior. Secondly, it may be that you've known the Lord for a long time. You know you've already made that surrender to Jesus. But you've let some things come into your life that you know you need to take back to, you need to take to the cross of Christ and you're just within your heart, you feel like you need to make a fresh dedication of your life to Jesus. You want to recommit your life to Jesus Christ and get back on track with Him. If that's the desire of your heart, I want you to lift your hand up high. Whether you're in the church here, God bless you. God bless you. Whether you're in the church here or whether you're watching by internet, just lift your hand up high. And then thirdly, uh, it may be that you, you know you're born again, you, you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit, you have an ever-abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in you, but you want more of the Holy Spirit. You want to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. If that's the desire of your heart, I want you to lift your hand up high. Say, I, I, want, I want to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. I want more of the Holy Spirit in my life. If that's you, lift your hand up high. Let's all stand to our feet. And I want to ask those that lifted their hands for any of those three categories, whether to come to the Lord for the very first time or whether to rededicate your life to the Lord or whether to, to be filled or refilled with the Holy Spirit. If you raised your hands for any of those three categories, we want to invite you to come up to the front of the church because we want to have a, a prayer partner to, to help you and pray with you further uh, at the close of the service. So we invite you to come up. You can come up at any time while we say this prayer. And let's all say this prayer together. Amen. Internet audience, we invite you to say this prayer with us. And let's say it to encourage those that may have lifted their hands that are watching by internet. Let's say this together. Heavenly Father, have mercy on me, a sinner. I repent for all my sins and ask your forgiveness. Jesus, I accept you now and forever as my personal Lord and Savior. I invite you into my heart and I ask you to take charge of my life and make something very beautiful and very wonderful out of it. Thank you for giving me a new beginning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand clap. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. To God be the glory. Uh, we want to remind the internet audience that there's a prayer request button at glorychurch.com. If you'd like to go there on the internet, if you're not already there, glorychurch.com. We're the Lord's Glory Church coming to you from Humble, Texas, near Houston. I'm Pastor Tom Battle. This is the Lord's Glory Church where we give Jesus all the glory. And that's the name we want you to remember. If you're ever in this area, please uh, come visit us. You'll find directions on how to get here in service times at glorychurch.com. Also, if you live in this area and don't have a home church, 
we encourage you to come out here and, and uh, be a part of this church. We'd love to welcome you into this congregation. Uh, God bless you. We love you. Thank you again for being with us. We'll be here tonight at 6 p.m. with a corporate prayer service. that will be streamed live over the Internet. So please come back with us. And we invite those here, all those that come, can come back and pray with us at 6 o'clock this evening. Uh, also, we have a full service Wednesday night that's streamed live on the Internet. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. And thank all of you. And have a wonderful uh, Sunday afternoon. And look for that one person. Amen. God bless you. Thanks again.